seats in place. And don't play with the checkerboards because this is also called an escape room. So have the seats in place. Have the seats in place. I can't. Were you ever in here? I did. I came in and had dinner a couple times sure, with the captain, yeah, and yeah, uh, sure, yeah. It was the invite only. Yeah, of course. I'll talk. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. Or if yeah, I had to break them on something. Okay, exactly. We'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk. And, and you don't mind me answering no. because your great resources and office are <laughs> relative to that position. So everybody, sit down where you can. Okay. And you can go any place you want to, I guess. <laughs> do me a favor. Don't, don't, don't touch the, uh, the, the, the set here because we make this room a, an escape room so that the stuff that's here has to be in a certain position so that folks come in here and try to get out of here in an hour. They have those are part of the clues. Cool again, do. welcome aboard the Battleship Wisconsin, folks. Uh, again, you're, you know, it's a great, it's going to be a great, a great day for, for all of us because Ken's here and I, I, you're going to have a lot of fun on this tour. Now, a little bit of just general information. You're on the Battleship Wisconsin. It's the last battleship ever built. And it's an Iowa class of battleships. First off, besides Ken, who else was in the military? Yeah, you were in what? What did you do, sir? I was, I was in the Army. Army? Okay, well, welcome. Super. Okay, got Army, Navy, Marines. My son was in the Marines. Okay, super, but he's not here. Okay, that's good. So, and it's an Iowa class of battleship. <laughs> when you build a ship, the first ship you build gets a name. In this case, it was called Iowa, BB-61. All the other three ships that were built looked alike, and they're called Iowa class. So, the first one was 61, BB-61 is Iowa. Second one, and I love the quizzes, so pay attention. I'm going to do some quizzes. 62 is in New Jersey, 63 is in Missouri, and 64 is in Wisconsin. They all look alike. They're all Iowa-class battleships. The most unique thing about this ship and its sister ships, out of all the ships you could visit across this beautiful country, the only class of ships, that are all museums, are this class of ships. No other ship. You have a ship here and there. And they, here's, here's where the quiz comes in. Iowa's in San Pedro, California. New Jersey's in Camden, New Jersey. Where's the Missouri folks? Come on. Big old kid, super. And why is it in Pearl Harbor? Because it's in that, I think, because that's where uh, the scientists. Exactly. The Japanese signed the surrender on, on the Missouri. And the deck you we met on is called the surrender deck. It's the captain's porch, but it's the surrender deck on the Missouri. Super. Very good. Very now, good. And then, very good. See, he, he's going really to answer the questions. And then this is the Wisconsin. It's the last battleship ever built. There were two other battleships that were built to look like it, the Kentucky and the Illinois but they were only finished up to the, uh, the main deck when the war was over, so, they were, so the last battleship ever built. Um, the, uh, the ship is 887 foot, 3 inches long. In 1944, when it was commissioned, it was 30 <coughs> foot longer than an Essex classic carrier. Today, carrier is about 150 foot shorter, but this was a capital vessel. And we'll get into why it's a capital vessel, because one of them is the biggest ship in the fleet at that particular time. The ship is 108 feet wide. Why is it only 108 feet wide? It's deep. Get through the Panama Canal. Panama Canal. Panama Canal is 110 feet wide. Guys like Bose, the Bose's mate who pipe, uh, pipe, pipe on board, Bose's mates would hold their mattresses along the side so they wouldn't scratch the paint because once they go through the Panama Canal, they had to hang, hang over the side and paint. So they would rather scratch up their mattresses and hang over the side and paint out the sea along the line. When you came aboard the ship, you're on deck one. And we went up a ladder, we're on the O1 level. So if you're on deck one, we could go down, and in engineering tour, we go down seven decks, and we're on the O1 level, we're going up to the O5 level, and we'll talk about how to read that in a moment. But we have 12 levels on the ship, seven decks. The top of the tower to the bottom of the keel, this ship is almost as tall as the SunTrust building across the street, 19 stories. It'll feel how big it is, okay? When the ship was built, it was designed for 1,900 men, so it was bucks for 1,900 men. And then World War II broke out, ship was, uh, was refitted real quick with more guns, had 127 guns on it. What happened was, because of those guns, they needed more gunners made. So it was still 2,900 men on a ship that only could hold 1,900. So they had a lot of hot racks. And when you walk around, you'll see the racks and chains, uh, pictures of them in chains, or if you go into Nautica, you should see them. Those guys would either hot rack, meaning share a bunk, you know, get off duty, come on duty, or they would shorten the distance between the train's chains, so if a, a gentleman like Kent was sitting in a bunk and he, and he, and he had, had to turn over in his sleep and he got the short bunk, he had to pick his back or his stomach to sleep on. So a lot of guys would just sleep on the deck more line, so it was very uncomfortable. Uh, and the ship was decommissioned and recommissioned for Korea. We had 2,400 men in Korea. Then it was decommissioned again and it sat in the ghost fleet for 30 years. And all that means is it's, it's tied up, uh, basically uh, dehumidified. Reagan was president, he wanted a 600 fleet navy, so we recommissioned all the battleships plus others, so that we have, because it was easier to, to, to re 
25th and October 6th to build. So we, we were recommissioned back in 88, 89 in, in the Gulf War, and you served in the Gulf War, correct? Yes. You served in the Gulf War, and there, was six, there were 1,600 men, 15 to 1,600 men on the ship then because we got a lot, rid of a lot of guns that had Tomahawk missiles, and we're going to show you what those Tomahawk missiles are. So the complement went way down. You're sitting, you're looking at a ship that really was retrofitted in 1889. So a lot of stuff on here that goes back to 44. If you take an engineering tour, you'll see all that equipment is 1944 vintage. But it's an 88 kind of arrangement along the line. Now in the Navy, you have uh, in, in the Army and in the, in the Army and also the Marines, but you have enlisted warrant officers and, and officers. Enlisted are E1s to E789s. Uh, and when you're 7809 a chief in the Navy, you're a department manager. So I, I worked for, I was a machinist mate, I worked for a chief, machinist mate. He ran the department. He basically doesn't work anymore, he just manages. Matter of fact, he sits and drinks a lot of coffee and eats a lot. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. So they're department managers. And then if you're a warrant officer, you're a technician. I, had, I worked with a guy who was a first class at E5, became a warrant officer, very well respected because he knew his division very well. He's respected by the non-commissioned officers enlisted and also commissioned officers, even though he's a non-commissioned officer. And then you have the officers. You were an O what? O2. O2. And then you became a what? I uh, retired as an 05. 05. Now, an 05 is in the Navy, an 05 is a, uh, is commander. a commander. Is a commander. On this ship, is a capital vessel, and you had an 06, which is a captain. Now, but on any ship, whether it's a male or female running the ship, whether it's an enlisted or an officer, you're always called a captain when you're running a ship. So if you're a chief petty officer on a tugboat, you're the captain. On this ship, you were an 06, which is a captain rate. But you also called a captain. So this ship had, I think the executive officer was a captain too. Yes, sir. I think wasn't the CEC, uh, well, we'll talk about later on. But, but basically, this ship, because it's a capital vessel, to be a, 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 a commander or captain of a capital vessel, you have to sail on some deep, deep draft ships. The ship draft is 37 feet. When you came aboard the gangway, if you didn't notice, there was a black gray line. We are 37, that's 37 feet from that black gray line to the keel. The reason why it was so high is the ship weighs 58,000 tons fully loaded, but we have no fuel, food, people, or ammo on it. So basically, it's was, was about 24 foot high along the line from that standpoint, but that's the draft. So deep draft ships, are, you know, you have to be a, run a deep draft ship before you can become a captain on a particular vessel. This captain here, this captain here, this is his import cabin. We'll see his import stateroom. He has two other staterooms or cabin or spaces. One is behind the navigation bridge, much smaller. He has access to the bridge all the time with that. Has his own bed up there, his own desk, his own bathroom or head. He has another one, I think, uh, three levels up. It's much smaller. But this is where he basically would survive, live, do everything. His stateroom house close out, close in. He has working for him, and this is why I have my fun with my Marines. I love fun with Marines. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't hit me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I have friends that are Marines, and we pick on each other all the time. Uh, Marines love to guard things and shoot people. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Exactly. <laughs> and he would have a Marine guard, an orderly, behind that door at uh, the table. It was his orderly, he kept an eye on him, kept pr protecting him of sorts. And behind that picture would be a galley. In that galley, he had a culinary specialist. He was a chief. He was a culinary specialist picked by the Pentagon. And the reason why was he has to know all kinds of foods, cultures. So when this ship pulls into port, you've got, you got uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dignitaries and, and presidents of countries come on board. He has to know how to cook the food to not insult their culture along that line. So if you go into Israel, you don't cook pork. You go into India, you don't cook hamburger along the line. So that's his function. He only, he only cooks for one guy, which is the captain and all his guests along the line. Now, he rooms with the other chiefs, and every so often, and, and, and Kent made a comment, he, he had dinner up here with the captain. But if the captain invites, I say that sarcastically, invites a lieutenant up here because he's going to chew his buns out, well, this guy hears what's going on, but everybody wants to know why the captain, the lieutenant got cheered out. He ain't going to tell him because he doesn't want to lose his, his position as being a uh, uh, cook for one guy <coughs> instead, of cook for, instead of a cook for six hundred along that line. Now, he, um, did, you know, did you know Captain Blush? I do. Okay, you know Captain. Captain Blush told us these stories. You tell me if they're <laughs> correct. Captain Blush, the story Captain Blush, Captain Blush was 6'3", and he would love to invite officers like Kent up for dinner or for lunch. He'd also have wanted a good report between him and the chiefs, you know, the guide department managers. 
So we often would invite them up for lunch. Now, chiefs at that time had big guts on them and drank coffee. They didn't do much work anymore. They just managed. So the story goes is that uh, Captain Blush would have for lunch a cup of soup and a salad. And it got around pretty quick. If you were invited to lunch with the captain, okay, you better eat before you eat because all you're going to have is soup and salad. So it was very common all our life. One of the other stories Captain Blush told us was even though very few spaces were air conditioned except for CEC in here, the Captain Blush didn't like air conditioning because he wanted to suffer like the rest of the crew. <laughs> so he was in the South Pacific, left the portholes open. He's at his desk on the red phone talking to somebody official, could be the White House, could be the Pentagon. This guy also has a top secret clearance because he has to hear that stuff without and be trusted with it. But the story goes is that he, he also Captain Blush loved his Marines, am I correct? He did. He did. So what happened was his, uh, he had a fly coming, he's, he's trying to swat the fly, he couldn't swat it. So he called to his orderly, he says, come in here and kill the fly. Well, the Marines walking around with a 45, cock 45 in the room. <laughs> I wasn't here when he did that, or he'd have been in trouble. <laughs> well, he didn't get in trouble with the captain. And the story goes is that the captain loved his Marines so much, he challenged them. He says, if you guys, uh, if you guys take over a five-inch mount and fire faster than my gunner's mates and keep it cleaner than my gunner's mates, I'll let you put your Marine ammo on it. So when you go after the ship and come up to start the side, uh, and when you're out, you'll see a Marine emblem on a five-inch mount. That is the five-inch mount that the Marines embarrassed the gunner's mates. And, and, and they love embarrassing gunner's mates. So. <laughs> that was our gun mount. That was your gun mount, exactly. Was exactly. So, you want to add anything about what I said? Anything at all? Uh, I, uh, one thing I'll add is that, um, that you might find interesting is that the one time I, I was up here a couple times to eat, but the one time I came up to eat was after Desert Storm. I got invited up because the, the, the needed the department heads, and my Marine CO was sick. And he told me, you got to go to this dinner. And I went to the dinner, and the uh, guest of honor was the uh, governor of Wisconsin at really? the time, and, okay. and that, who was uh, Governor Tommy Thompson, who later on was the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, and he sat right here and had dinner with us. Really, really nice gentleman. Super. And were you, were you in, in, in this command at all when the Colin Powell? And I was. I was here when General Powell. Describe that. Exactly. You're the first thing. Tell me, describe <laughs> that portion. Okay. He, General Powell came on board the ship. It was uh, during Desert Storm. It was probably about October of 90. And uh, toured the ship, wanted to see everything that was going on, and uh, he uh, went around the ship, and then he, he ended up, there's a pretty famous picture that he likes to use in a lot of his books and stuff, but he's standing all the way up on the forward part of the ship, and the picture's basically taken from behind him, and you'll see the entire, almost the entire crew, except for the sailors and marines who were still at their duty stations, and, and it's, a, it's his back, basically, and he's standing up on the front, and he's speaking to the crew, and the entire crew is just hanging on every gun and every, you know, standing on top of the turrets and all the way into the back. And uh, he came out and gave a real nice talk, and then uh, General Schwarzkopf also came out. And, uh, and then there was another day that was probably the big, one of the biggest days where we, we had 14 U.S. Senators show up on the ship on one day. I think it was 14, to include... Senator Kerry, who was the Democrat nominee for president, uh, John Glenn, the famous Marine and senator, and a number of other senators that all showed up that day and toured the ship. You want to do the rest of the tour? No, <laughs> you're doing great. Follow me, folks. Okay.